we're approaching the village of Wigington, which is a small village in the county of Staffordshire in England. It was from this village 50 years ago that 14 year old Judith Roberts set off from home on her bicycle and never returned. She would have ridden along these streets heading for the country lanes that joined her village with another one and a half miles away. This village has no doubt grown in size over the years but we pass older houses that we recognise from news broadcasts at the time of Judith's murder. It was on the evening of June the 7th 1972 that 14 year old Judith Roberts left her home after a silly tiff with her parents about wearing makeup. Like many teenagers before her and since, she left the house, perhaps feeling angry or upset. She took her bike and she pedalled off through the village that we've just driven through and onto these country lanes, which join her village to Comberford village, which is just one and a half miles away. It was on these narrow country roads, surrounded on both sides by fields, that she met her death. Not only did this case involve a huge miscarriage of justice that meant an innocent man spent 25 years in prison for a murder that he didn't commit, there have also been later links made with Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. In this video today, we'll examine the cold case and we'll explore the village of Wigington and the crime scene location where Judith's body was found. Judith was an intelligent girl. Attending grammar school, she was academic and had a bright future ahead of her. On this early summer evening, as she navigated these lanes, she may well have pedalled right past her killer, who was parked in a field entrance, waiting. After her murder had been discovered, witnesses came forward to say that they had seen a man standing by a car in the entrance to a field and later witnesses reported seeing that same car slowly trailing Judith. Who can tell if Judith sensed the danger, sensed the predator tailing her slowly along these quiet roads, waiting for his opportunity? From evidence pieced together, it appears that Judith was physically dragged off her bike into a nearby field where she was beaten around the head and left with her bike only a few feet away from her. She'd been partially covered in hedge clippings and old fertiliser bags. She lay for three days before she was discovered. What followed has been described as one of the most intense murder hunts in the Midlands. Around 200 detectives were involved, taking over 15,000 sets of fingerprints and 11,000 statements. The police didn't rule out that it was a local man, or someone from further afield. They conducted many door-to-door -door inquiries and scoured the undergrowth on Cumberford and Wigginton lanes for any clues that would lead to the person responsible. It was an outrage that a 14-year-old girl from a sleepy little village could go out for a ride on her bike and never come home. Four months after the murder, 17-year-old Andrew Evans, a recruit from nearby army barracks, presented himself at the police station convinced he was the killer. The teenager was in poor health, stuttering and sometimes incoherent. He reported that he kept having a dream where he saw Judith's face and he became convinced that he was the one who had murdered her. At the time, Evans was taking medication for depression and he was considered a fantasist. The police continued to interview him over a three-day period, with him becoming more and more sure of his own involvement. His parents weren't present for these interviews, he had no legal representation and no doctor was consulted. At the end of these interviews, Evans confessed to the murder. His trial began in June 1973, but by this time Evans no longer believed that he committed the crime. Unfortunately, he couldn't prove his alibi that he'd been in the barracks on the night of the murder and his original confession was believed. He was jailed for life. He meekly accepted the verdict and it wasn't until 20 years later that he began to fight the conviction and his sentence. 
1994, after a successful campaign, he was acquitted and released. His original confession was found to claim things that didn't match the evidence, and it was clear that he'd been mentally unwell, a minor, and that he couldn't have committed the crime for which he spent 25 years of his life in prison for. He was later awarded £750,000 in compensation. In recent years, there have been links made with Judith's death and the crimes of Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. Sutcliffe was convicted of murdering 13 women and attempting to kill seven more during the 70s and early 80s. The links were made after Sarah Clark, the daughter of one of Judith's friends, did painstaking research of the crimes. The similarities that she uncovered are quite compelling. For example, the man seen in the vicinity on the day of the murder matched Sutcliffe's description. Dark hair and long sideburns. This man wore the type of clothing Sutcliffe admitted to wearing when he was hunting his victims, namely work clothes and Wellington boots. The car that had been seen in the field entrance matched the car belonging to Sutcliffe's mother-in-law, which he often borrowed, and he was staying with her at this time. Judith was bludgeoned to death, in the same manner Sutcliffe murdered his victims. Sarah Clark was even able to match up wounds found on Judith to those found on some of Sutcliffe's victims, indicating the use of the same murder weapon some of which had been custom made by Sutcliffe. It was an incorrect assumption at the time that the Yorkshire Ripper only attacked prostitutes. From looking at his known victims, it seemed he was opportunistic and any woman or girl was fair game for him. Peter Sutcliffe died in prison on the 30th of November 2020 after a diagnosis of COVID-19. He was 74. He was never charged with Judas' murder, and since the scandal of Andrew Evans's huge miscarriage of justice, no one has been held accountable for the murder of Judith Roberts. Okay, so this is the cycle rope camera's facing towards um, the village where Judith lived. She would have cycled along here, going in that direction. A witness had said that they saw a man in a car which matches the description of Peter Sutcliffe's mother-in-law's car which he used to borrow, parked in a field entrance. So we think, can't be exactly sure, we think it could very well have been here. Big enough for a car. And it's a big field. seen here with his boot up and then somebody else said they saw the car following behind Judith who would have been riding her bike up this road and the very next field entrance on the left up here is where her body was found. Police believe she was dragged from her bike into the field and that's where she was murdered and where she was later found. So she didn't actually get very far from the village where she lived. If that was indeed Peter Sutcliffe, who was waiting, 
opportunistically just waiting. And then he didn't have very far to go to follow her in his car. I mean, these roads are really narrow. You know, we've had to pull over to let all the cars get by. It doesn't look as though it's particularly changed very much since 1972 along here. We've seen old um, footage that was released at the time on the news where they talked about what they were doing. You can see people on either side of the road um, in these bushes looking for clues. And it really doesn't look any different really changed at all and here we are so it's from there where the car is to here that he followed her where he would have left his car I don't know but judging by the photographs, matching it all up that's the next one okay, so this very well could have left his car here it's so quiet it probably would have been a lovely summer evening we know she'd had a bit of a tiff with her parents, a bit of an argument over wearing makeup. I mean, how awful for them that that's the last memory that they have. And she's just gone off and got on her bike like, like any one of us had done at her age when we fed up and feel hard done to and you pedal off and think your thoughts and try and get it out of your system. I can remember doing that. And uh, yeah, off she goes on her bike. And there's somebody waiting, somebody watching. Somebody who follows her. Yeah, this is it. If you look at the old footage, there was a gate here, and you can see you can see the old gate posts inside the hedge, the gate's gone and this is it, this is the field, this is where she was found So this is the field where Judith's body was found, obscured from the road by a hedge. Her bike was found close by. Behind me where you see the hay bale there used to be a fence we can see the fence posts buried inside the hedge and there is old footage taken at the time which we've matched up with with pylons we're pretty sure this is the spot Houses over there I look back out onto these fields, and there, situated inside Wigginton Village, where Judith lived. So in 
June. It would have still been light. At six, half six. It's still really quiet, really quiet country lane. Reports have it that she was spotted on her bike by two people. And that an eyewitness had seen a man following closely behind her in a car. That man had been seen prior, parked very close to the village in um, Cumberford Lane, which is the narrow country road that comes out of Wigington Village and heads towards Cumberford Village. And that's the road that we've driven along. We drove right from Wigington all the way to the end to Cumberford Village and then we turned around and we've used old photographs to kind of figure out the location we're pretty sure this is in. Reports are that she was snatched from her bike, dragged from her bike, I guess into this field. she was then bludgeoned to death hit several times in the head which is a signature of Peter Sutcliffe the Yorkshire Ripper Fifty years on, the small and close-knit village of Wigington does not forget. There are many still there that remember Judith and that awful day in June 1972, when tents went up in the fields opposite their houses. Tents that shielded the horror of a 14-year-old child, beaten and killed whilst riding her bike. <laughs>